So I'm going to talk about some aspects of um, the non-termination behavior in the uh, in time class inference. So informally speaking, when I say time class inference, I really uh, mean uh, uh, instant resolution aspects. So normally you would view this uh, time class inference as uh, Try to extend the Hindu Hindu algorithm together with uh, the mechanism to construct evidence and things like that. So I will restrict myself into uh, these aspects in this talk. So for instant resolution, uh, we can view it uh, contains two aspects. One is uh, contact reduction, which allow you to Determine whether a given instant or a given instant is that the evidence for that given instant is constructible or not, uh, and the process of evident construction, which uh, will actually construct an evidence for you if you know it, it will be constructible. But sometimes these two aspects might overlap, so it's not like a strict separation. Uh, so let's see a very simple example of Thai class. So we have this equality class and the equality method, uh, the Thai annotation for that is uh, it contains a constraint on equality of A and it compares two elements of Thai A and return the Boolean. So with that, we can uh, go on to define instance for uh, pairs and the definition is usual, we compare each element of the pair and of course we are assuming we have the ability to compare uh, each element in the pair. And we can do that the same with uh, a concrete type called character or char. And in this case we just write some primitive function that will do the comparison of character for us. So then with this instant declaration and type class, uh, we can write, we can apply the equality methods to compare two pairs. So if we look at the type of this test, uh, without doing any further reduction, uh, the type might look like uh, equality on a pair of character within a constraint. And <coughs> on the right hand side of this thick arrow, it's the boolean. So what this intuitive means is that uh, for test to return a value of boolean, you must supply the evidence of, uh, of type, well, an evidence for this constraint equality on a pair of characters. So here's one translation, and we can translate the type class into uh, intermediate language with, where it all the type class go away and we have the ordinary data type and function definition. So the type class becomes data type and well this data type really is a, a single has a single constructor that wraps the uh, corresponding method and return the evidence of type EQA. And equality method will just be taking an evidence of EQA and return the containing method. And the uh, instant declaration becomes <coughs> some sort of evident constructor or transformer. So uh, the so here I introduce a new name F where it takes in two evidence of type EQA and EQB and return an evidence of type EQ of a pair. So uh, so the return type here is a constructor wrapped with this queue. Uh, this queue, the definition of this queue, uh, looks exactly like the uh, the method we see here, except uh, we here we insert the the evidence at the corresponding place, and the evidence is coming from the inputs for this app. And we do the same thing with G, where uh, G will just directly return the evidence of character. So now we look at the test. 
uh, by this translation, we will have we will have to insert a thing. I, we don't know what that yet, so we, let's call that B. And we want what this means is we want to construct some evidence uh, of this type, EQ of A of char, and we want to know how, uh, what the shape of this D is. So that's the that might be the job for this contact reduction does. So the question now becomes, uh, given these two declaration, where f taking a and b return a pair and g is a character, how to automatically construct an d such that d has this type. So one way to do that is to view the two declaration we have as, as some sort of rule to, to allow you to reduce things. So the first, first declaration well, the signature for f can can be viewed as a uh, a rewrite rule where the you will do the rewriting one the multi set of predicates. I'll, I'll call this predicate. Uh, you keep the so this dot 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 means somewhere in in your set you observe there is a predicate that looks like equal a b. If that's the case, uh, you can apply this rule to get. EQA and EQB and keep the rest of the context unchanged. Uh, so the same thing go on with the G signature. So for G, we just uh, reduce away this character so we keep the rest of the context unchanged. So with, with this uh, reduction build on, on determining whether it's, uh, the, this is constructible or not, we can uh, now begin with uh, begin with a singleton, a set of singleton that contains only a predicate EQ, a pair of char. And we apply, so here we, just, we can apply the first rule, which will give us char and char. And now we can apply the second rule twice, so we can reduce, uh, reduce it to empty. So, so what this <coughs> means is that now we actually successfully construct the evidence for the EQ of a pair of char. And, uh, Evident will looks like f applied to g and g, so which is assuring because it's it would be what we do manually. So so within the process of constructing evidence, it seems like we uh, we implicitly assume this process will always be terminating, right? So here we. We observe that this reduction begins with a pair of char. In the end, it reduces to empty. And sometimes we might we might get some error because uh, we might reduce to some some other like eq bool where bool we didn't define the instance for equality on bool yet. So in that case, we can throw an error saying the instance of eq bool is undefined. So. So we implicitly assume this process will be terminating. So now the question is, uh, what happens if we have a non-terminating reduction process? How would we deal with that situation? So this example is from uh, Lambo and Peyton Jones Squiggle, where well, they discuss. Uh, there they, they, they define this, they have to define these three uh, instant process. Uh, we, I take out all the methods because we don't want to uh, take the method into account yes, here. So, so in, in that example, they have uh, three, three type class. Uh, size is a type class, data and size are type class. And data D, well sorry, size D is a type and size D is a concrete type and char is a concrete type and all those are type variable. So they have these three instant declaration. And we can uh, build those declaration as some sort of uh, rewrite rule on, uh, on a set of predicates that allow you to do corresponding uh, reduction. So we, well, in this case, we simply reverse the arrow. And so here, the arrow here really means implication. But when we reverse the arrow, it becomes a reduction step. So it shouldn't be uh, surprising with this rule. So now, 
we could ask this question that whether the evidence for data of size d and char is constructible or not. So if we pose this question, uh, then it becomes uh, the process of trying to reduce. So we begin with this data size d char, and we try to apply this three rule uh, as many as possible. Well, we try to normalize this this term, so to speak. So, so as we see, uh, we begin with data size d char, and in we can use the second rule because we can match C to size D, which will give us sets of size D applied to char. And then we can apply the third rule. Uh, it will give us, so third rule will just give us size T, in this case size char. And we see we can apply the first rule now where it will generate a size, well, data size D and T. In this case, it will be data size D and char. So if we look at where we begin, and after applying the, those BCA3 rule, we kind of reach to where we are beginning with. So this process will be diverging. So now, the question is, how can we do or deal with this situation if we really want those instant declaration. Uh, so one way to handle the situation is uh, doing some kind of cycle detection uh, or type the normal thing. So we, this method will try to observe where, whether there are some, some cycle that can occur in the process of, of doing this reduction. So in this case, indeed, it, we, we can see there is a cycle. And with, with this <coughs> observation, we can take advantage of the underlying la lazy semantics of, of the languages. Uh, so uh, in that case, we can define D e in terms of D. So it's the definition of D will be uh, we apply A to D cell and return the results to C and apply, supply that to B. So that's one way to, uh, to handle this divergent situation. And he also relies on the underlying lazy uh, semantics. So, so we see th this cycle detection it is indeed useful and uh, most of the time. But there are some cases uh, it might just be too hard for our cycle detection technique to, uh, to work out. Uh, so here is a, a slightly contrived example. <coughs> uh, so here I, I, we can imagine we might have some data type called nasty A, and uh, it has two constructs, so it's in a GAGT format. Uh, new has type nasty A, cons, taking an element of type A, and uh, uh, elements of nasty and list of A, and return the nasty A. So we see it's sort of a cheeky data type because the the inputs for the second input for this comps it's taken something bigger in some sense. So with this data type, uh, we might want to define equality on this data. So even it looks very strange, but still it contains a finite, finite, web, finite sets of value. And with finite sets of value, we still want to compare uh, those finite value. Uh, so we. We could write a declaration that looks like this. Uh, well, we define a equality method on STA. So, and we proceed to define the equality method for the empty case. Uh, we automatically return true. For the well, I guess I have actually missing a case here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so for the non-empty case, you both both nasty and non-empty. Then we, we uh, reconcile 
apply the EQ on AB and EQ on ASBS. So this EQ applied to AB will give rise to the equality assumption on A, and equality applied to AS and BS will, um, will might give us this uh, assumption uh, equality on ST to square root of A. So this uh, instant declaration effectively gives rise to this uh, reduction rule. So anywhere we see a nasty A, we can replace this to EQA and EQ nasty of a list of A. So with this, this rule, imagine we, we try to compare two, uh, two nasty char. So we want to construct, well, we want to see whether the evidence for the EQ nasty char is constructible or not. Then in that case, we, well, since here we just have one rule to begin with, so we might, we will apply this and we get uh, nasty or list of char. And then we can apply this rule again because A can replace A to a list of char. And this in turn will give us EQ list of char and EQ nasty and with now we have a two list type constructor applied to char and as we see this thing get bigger and bigger without any uh, forming any loop so it, it will diverge and it, uh, we might we cannot observe any cycle in, in this uh, declaration. So we, we see that uh, we might, well, in some cases, we do want to take care of those uh, divergent uh, reduction situation. And, and our current notion of contact reduction seems too eager in the sense that we always try to apply the rule as much as possible and try to really get the normal form of, of, the, of the query. So we might ask the question, can we somehow make the reduction, <coughs> reduction process a lazy? Uh, that, so this is just uh, a way that I've been thinking of uh, recently. So I'm not even sure how extensible this view is, but I'll just uh, represent it anyway. So we, we will the we will the instant declaration give us uh, contact reduction on on sets of predicates, but uh, we can also build the reduction process as reduction on uh, some sort of meta level first order term. So for the equality example, uh, we can build this. Uh, predicate EQ applied to a pair of AB as some kind of meta level first order term. And we, we add this rule, it's saying whenever we see this term, we can rewrite that to F applied to EQA and EQB. And the same goes for char. So every time we see an EQ applied to char, we replace that to G. So the f and g are some kind of function uh, can be, might be in the end, it can be realized as some sort of uh, function, function definition. So now the process of constructing the evidence becomes, with this view on, on reduction on, on the term, then the process of constructing, for example, the equality on a pair of char, uh, can become, it's really, now it's really concrete. So to know the evidence for this EQ of pair of char, we actually want to know, well, we can, uh, we can apply this rule and the normal form of this, uh, this sequence of reduction will give us uh, this F applied to G and applied to G, which is the evidence we want. But I guess, Maybe one of the benefits of viewing this as uh, rewriting on first order term is that, so here I kind of do this, applying this rewrite rule eagerly, meaning 
I always try to reduce the argument of this function f. So in, in the end, I get f and g and g. So we might imagine uh, if it might give us a choice to not to uh, do the reduction eagerly, then we relied on the lazy process of this f. So it might give us a chance to, to do the reduction lazy uh, in the end. So a uh, quick summarize and is so the takeaway message is uh, I guess evident construction process is really a kind of rewriting process and the knowledge of knowing the termination behavior of, of those instant declaration or in the rule form might give us the benefits of uh, deciding beforehand to whether to uh, construct the evidence eagerly or to do that lazily. Uh, so that is the observation. And uh, the next step I, I like to explore is to see how the current, how we can extend the current cycle detection uh, technique to obtain evidence statically. Uh, for those non obvious looping example. And a uh, long term goal is to uh, explore the connection between the, this if my potentially infinite rewriting process with the notion of uh, productivity in Kaja's uh, structural resolution. Um, so for the cycle detector, when you find, when you define the d equals uh, f of g of d or b c of a of d, um, are you saying that that is evidence um, or not? Because surely I, I would say evidence is something is would be the output of a, a terminating function or, or a reductive function, whereas um, yeah, so that has the correct type, but might not necessarily give you the correct method that you want. Because uh, it might not, because it will be not terminating. Well, I guess it, it might be non-terminating in the sense of eager evaluation. Mm -hmm. But it, if we are in a lazy language, then it will actually, it could terminate and it, it or it might actually be a productive functional definition in that case. Yeah, so, so it still has to be productive. To yeah, so, so yeah, it, it, it's good to have some sort of mechanism to ensure this kind of productive productiveness so that we can actually make those, this definition useful. Okay, I was, I was a bit worried when I saw that, oh, we can just ignore the loop or something, but that's okay, it's productive. The, um, your example of the nested base type uh, that doesn't work with the naive um, sort of eager evaluation strategy. Uh, have you actually sort of pushed that through with a lazy rewriting approach, or is that uh, your future? That can be uh, if we yeah. So so that can actually be done manually. Uh, in the sense that we can actually define those f and we call it uh, this as function definition. So instead of building this as a rewrite rule, rewrite from, from left to right, we can build this, some, this EQ as some kind of function that's taken a type and give you the evidence of that type. So, so it, I know for sure that it will work for, for this because you, it kind of relied on the lazy evaluation process. Hello. That's a fascinating example, uh, particularly as the, the problem seems to start because that's somehow the wrong instance. Uh, the second constraint should be unnecessary. You mean this one? Yeah. Yes, so I, 
Yeah, so this, this is that. somewhat contrived. You can actually eliminate this constraint. Yeah, but, but also figuring out how to see that the second constraint is unnecessary is also an interesting search problem. Because you can see that you're going, just simply from the second clause of the, the conjunction, you can see that you're going to need an instance like that, yeah. but realizing that in fact you've already got one is, uh, is <coughs> what's fun. Uh, to some extent, it, there's a sort of issue here where we, it's a sort of classic problem with type classes, where what's really going on here is that nested is, is not a fixed point over types, it's a fixed point over type operators. Hmm. And what's really crucial here is the <coughs> observation that list is a type operator that preserves showability, and therefore so is nested. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so preserves EQ. Sorry, e yeah. EQ, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, that's, in particular, the kind of, that's touching on a kind of constraint that we're just not allowed at the moment, because, uh, we don't get to have, we don't even get to have constraints which have universal quantifiers in them, let alone higher order constraints. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's, some, there's some sort of logic that's missing from the language that we're working with, then we just have to cope with the, the expressivity we have. Okay, anyone else? Or some last question perhaps? Okay, well, then I'd just like to thank Ubek for his talk.